to the book of Joshua, chapter 5. Joshua, chapter 5. Joshua, chapter 5. We're thankful for the opportunity to be back in the service. We're glad to see each one that's here tonight. Joshua, chapter 5 is where we're going to read from. Beginning in the first verse of that chapter. While you're finding your place, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for the day and for the blessings of it, Lord. I thank you for the many things you've done for us, the blessings of life you've given us, Lord. And I pray that you would help us tonight to deliver the message you've put on our heart. I pray you would open our hearts that we could receive it, Lord. Give us wisdom as your people use the message in, your, in, in our hearts as you see fit, Lord. Bless the request of the church. Lord, you know each one and each need, and I pray for each request. Lord, I pray for those that are lost, that they could see their need of Jesus while there's time and opportunity for these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Joshua chapter 5. And it came to pass when all the king of the Ammonites, which were on the side of Jordan westward, and all the king of the Canaanites, which were by the sea, heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of Jordan from before the children of Israel until we were passed over that their heart melted neither was their spirit in them any more because of the children of Israel and at that time the Lord said unto Joshua make these sharp knives and circumcise again the children of Israel the second time and Joshua made him sharp knives and circumcised the children of Israel at the heel of the foreskins and this is the cause why Joshua did circumcise all the people that came out of Egypt that were males, even all the men of war died in the wilderness by the way after they came of, out of Egypt. Now all the people that were, came out were circumcised, but all the children, excuse me, all the people that were born in the wilderness by the way as they came forth out of Egypt, them they had not circumcised. For the children of Israel walked forty years in the wilderness till all the people that were men of war which came out of Egypt were consumed because they obeyed not the voice of the Lord unto whom the Lord swore, swore that he w would not show them the land which the Lord swore unto his fathers, unto their fathers, excuse me, and that he gave us a land that floweth with milk and honey. I'm going to stop. I'll probably end up reading a few other verses so hold your place here we're going we're going to work off this idea a little bit of what Joshua was talking about here and uh, I want you to bear with me I know the the topic of that is is kind of growth to think about but there's a, a, a there's a beautiful picture here when we see what the Lord is doing through this all through the Bible there are pictures left for us to show us something and uh, we we see this. Let's get the kind of the the, the idea here that the circumstances and the context of what's going on uh, as we as we go forward in this in these uh, scriptures. The children of Israel, of course, have come out of the land of Egypt. They've wandered in the wilderness now for forty years. They've finally gotten to the place that they've crossed over the river of Jordan which is kind of where we began reading they've crossed over the river of Jordan and the, the kings of the Ammonites the kings of the Canaanites are uh, very distressed the scripture says that their heart melted uh, as as you can see here in the first verse their heart melted neither was their spirit in them anymore because of the children of Israel now that they've heard the children of Israel have been able to cross over the river of Jordan and come into the land of Canaan and the Lord dried up the river before them that they could cross over they're uh, terrified because of the children of Israel coming in to the land of Canaan. Often we hear and we think about the land of Canaan and what it represents in, in the scripture. And we, we get this idea of traveling to Canaan's land. Have y'all ever heard that in, an, in a song or something? You've heard the idea we're traveling to Canaan's land, uh, camping in Canaan's land. You see that all the time. Oftentimes what we think that represents is we think about going and moving to Canaan's land and that we're going into, we kind of got the symbol of death there if you will, and that we are going into uh, heaven. Canaan is pictured as a place of heaven. And so 
Uh, you can think of songs right now that we're crossing over Jordan and this is the last time we're crossing over into that place of uh, Canaan's land does not scripturally, scripturally speaking, Canaan's land does not represent heaven. I, I want to give you a few reasons why it does not represent heaven and then what it represents for us and what we can do with that. Canaan's land represents a life filled with the Spirit of God. It represents a life that we could live and have right here. It represents our inheritance in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what Canaan land represents. Now, if you go back to Ephesians chapter 1, every person who's saved has part of their inheritance right now. Is that right? That he's given us the earnest of the Spirit until the day he sealed us by the Spirit of God. He's given, which is the earnest of our inheritance, the Scripture says. He sealed us with the Spirit of God, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the day of the redemption of the purchased possession. That's verses 13 and 14 of the book of uh, Ephesians chapter 1. Earnest money is something that is given in advance, right? Y'all know what earnest money is. What God has done is he has given us a portion in advance by the Spirit of God. He's given us part of our inheritance in advance, which is the Spirit of God. We have rest. We have peace. We have joy. We have the fruit of the Spirit, which is our inheritance or the earnest of our inheritance through the Spirit of God until the redemption of the purchased possession in which we'll receive a greater portion, all of the rest of our inheritance, okay? Canaan land represents that. One day the children of Israel will, will inherit the entirety. They never inherited but just a small portion of what God had set out for them. If you go back and you look at the royal land grant, one day they're going to inherit the entirety of the, the uh, land grant that God had set out for them. Let me give you some scriptures about what this represents. What we see is as the children of Israel would leave Egypt, that represented salvation, God's deliverance, the Passover. We have the Passover lamb that was slain and, and, and the children of Israel were delivered from uh, Egypt. Now, Egypt's bondage. This, this is something that you can find much scripture about. Uh, they go on into the Red Sea and the scripture says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 that they were baptized in the Red Sea and they were baptized also in the cloud and they were baptized unto Moses in the Red Sea and in the cloud is what 1 Corinthians chapter 10 tells us. And so we see this, that, that Paul was pulling this same thing out. He was pulling this picture out of what this represented. And so the children of Israel have been baptized and been in, uh, in, the, in the Red Sea and, and in the cloud and they've come to this place of of uh, th that God had prepared for them this land that flows with milk and honey, this abundant life that they could have had, and they failed to go in because of a lack of faith, Hebrews chapter 3 and chapter 4. You can see this picture take place, which we mentioned a little bit this morning. And he says, there remaineth in Hebrews chapter 4, there remaineth there's a rest unto the people of God. In other words, we can have rest just as they had rest, but they missed out on their rest because it was not mingled with faith when they heard the word. And so now we've come to this time that, that they finally, they've wandered in the wilderness 40 years, and, and you've got this, uh, all of the people have passed away who are not allowed to go. Remember, it was the Caleb, Joshua, and all the people 20 years and younger were able to go into the land of Canaan. Everybody else died. And so you have this transition. That represents all the people that were of a lack of faith. And now they've crossed over into the river of Jordan. They've crossed over and they've come into the land of Canaan. And what's the first thing that God tells them to do? Get you some sharp knives and circumcise the people. If you take that and you go to Colossians chapter 2, verse 11, I believe it is. Begin about right there, you're going to find where the Scripture speaks and Paul writes of the circumcision made without hands. In other words, that the Lord circumcises us the moment we trust the Lord Jesus Christ. What does that mean? That means that there's a separation between our flesh and our soul. And our soul can never again be made unclean by the sins of the flesh. And that separation is made there. And that's what's happening here 
of the children of Israel in type. They've come in now. And in order for them to live and and to dwell in this land of Canaan, there had to be a separation that took place. There had to be a cutting away, if you will, of the flesh. Now, another thing that I want to mention in going into the land of Canaan is say, well, I'm not sure because I believe the land of Canaan still represents that idea of heaven. How many people had to fight to stay in heaven? And the children of Israel, how long did they fight in order to dwell in the land of Canaan? They've always fought to live there, haven't they? Just like we will always fight to dwell in that spiritual place. As long as we are alive and we are trying to live and follow God through the Spirit, we're going to fight tooth and nail to do that because we're in a spiritual war. So the children of Israel now are going into this land of Canaan. They're going into this land of of, of milk and honey, this place that God's promised them. Again, a lot of people want to use this to preach the idea of God's going to give us a bunch of stuff. The blessings that God has for us are worth way more than some kind of little earthly possessions. Okay? I'm not going to degrade what God will give you by telling you He's going to give you some money or some cars or a house or something like that. And don't look at me like I'm crazy when I'm preaching it that way because that's exactly what I would be doing is devaluing the blessing that God has given. It is worth so much more than than the earthly things that this world has to offer. But before they could go in, there had to be the cutting away of their flesh. They go in and began to fight in the battles. And God's already promised them that He's going to grant them the victory. They have the victory already. Just as we've been granted the victory. We've been granted the victory over the sin. We've been granted victory over the devil. We've been granted victory in this war that we fight. But sometimes we still lose, right? Sometimes we still lose the battle. Sometimes we go in like the children of Israel and and we try to fight and and go at it on our own. As they went down to Ai, sometimes we try to go in it and go at it on our own and we're going to conquer this thing by ourselves and and we're just going to muster up. So often what we do, we're just going to muster up the self-control, we're going to muster up enough of the flesh that, that, that we, can, we, we can get this together and, and, and we can do it again our, ourselves in our, in our own strength. And all that's going to do is lead us to get defeated. Because we cannot win without Christ. We're more than conquerors, but you can't leave out the other part of that. We're more than conquerors through Christ. Oftentimes we think of that verse over in Philippians chapter 4 and and, and the statement that we can do all things, how? Through Christ that strengtheneth us. But we forget John 15 over here where Jesus said, I am the vine and apart from me you can do what? Nothing. And so the children of Israel went down to Ai to try to Try to defeat them. We, we got this, you know, to see what the Lord has done for them. And so they go down there and try to take care of it themselves. Well, ain't no sense with even worrying many folks with this. We'll just send a few down here and we'll, we'll whip them. And they come back with their tail between their legs. They come back and they had gotten themselves in trouble. Why? Because they, did, they tried to do it without the Lord. And then we look at the battle of Jericho, which was just before the battle of Ai. And the deliverance that God gave. You see, that's what God can do to us. You, you think over in uh, 2 Corinthians, the statements made about the weapons of our warfare, not uh, carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. You think about the battle of Jericho. You see, God can tear the walls down around the strongholds. Say, so what's a stronghold? The stronghold is the sin that binds us, the sin that traps us, the lack of faith that we have. God can tear the walls down around those strongholds in our mind, rip those walls down, and that we can conquer these strongholds in our life through the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we see this picture. 
But before we can go in and start taking over the land, there's got to be the cutting away of the flesh. We've got to get rid of the old man. There's some things we've got to give up. Some things we've got to put behind us. The reason, and, and you'll notice that he, he begins to say uh, the, the cause, verse 4 he says, and this is the cause why Joshua did circumcise. And he begins to tell us that all the males of Egypt were, and then after they've come out of the, the land of Egypt, there was a period of time where none of, none of them were circumcised while they were in the, in, in the wilderness. And now that they've moved over into the land of Jordan, it's time to do that again. Why? But that was, that was a sign of separation. It was given to Abraham according to the covenant. As y'all remember, we studied the covenant as a sign of separation that you, you didn't belong to yourself anymore. You didn't belong to the world. You didn't belong to anybody else. You belonged to God. You were His. You were bought with a price. And the same thing's true for us. Every one of us that have trusted the Lord Jesus Christ have been circumcised. But we've been circumcised at heart. It's what the, the writer of Romans tells us in Romans chapter 2 that circumcision is, is not, that, not that that is fleshly, but that that is of the heart. And then they that are Jews are Jews inwardly. In other words, there needs to be not just this, this simple separation of something taking place and, and, and that's it. But there needs to be a literal separation between us and the world. So what, what is it that separates us from the world? What separates a child of God from the world is the way we think. That's what it should be. It's the way we think. Not just the way we dress. Oftentimes, that's kind of where we, we throw it. We say, well, let's separate ourselves. We should look different from the world. It's the way we think, that we should think different than the world. Turn with me to the book of Hebrews. Mark this place, however, in the Scripture. And turn with me to the book of Hebrews real quick. I want to show you something in chapter 4. Of the book of Hebrews, chapter 4. When you talk about that, that, if we're moving forward, if our goal is to move forward for the Lord, which the children of Israel were doing, they're moving into something that is far greater than any that they've ever been before, and that it's time to move forward for them and enter into this land that they've never been before. And so at first, the first thing is there's got to be some things that they've got to get rid of. They've got to cut away. They've got to get rid of those things. And that's true as a church. That's true as an individual. That's true for every one of us. Notice what he says in Hebrews chapter 4. And what he's speaking here is that there is a rest for us. There is a rest that we can have when we are in the place that God would have us to be. When we're doing the things that God would have us to do. We have a rest for our soul. We have a rest. Jesus made the statement, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, then I will give you rest. And He has given us rest. And so He's saying here that there remains a rest in the people of God. And He's comparing it with this rest that the children of Israel should have had in the land of Canaan, but did not have because of a lack of faith. And so he says, verse 9, There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. There's a rest for us today. It's not a physical rest where we're sitting down. It's a spiritual rest from our worries and our labors and our toilings that we can leave things to God. We have a rest. Let me, let me give you this way. How wonderful is it to know that as long as we do what God have us to do, we don't have to worry about eating. We don't have to be worried about taking, being taken care of. We don't have to worry about finances. I'm not saying that you don't. I'm just saying you don't have to. We're freed from all of that. We're at rest. That, that's, we're at complete rest. Everything's okay. Everything's good because God's got things under control. 
Everything's good between us and God. In the moment, you remember when we trusted the Lord Jesus Christ and our soul entered into that rest. It was a wonderful place. And so there remaineth therefore rest under the people of God. But notice what he says in verse 10. For he that is entered into his rest. In other words, the person that is entered into God's rest. For he that is entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works as God did from his. You remember what God did? Now he's comparing it now with the Sabbath. God labored six days and all that he did upon the, the, all the creation. And after six days, on the seventh day, he rested. And he's saying there remains a rest unto us. But if we're going to enter into that rest, then we've got to cease from our own labors. Which means we've got to cut away the flesh. Let me tie that together for you. How often do you spend doing the best you can to try to provide for yourself? Now I'm talking about toiling and worrying about providing for yourself. When God's already promised that he's going to provide for us. Let me ask you another question. What's the reason that you make the amount of money that you do? Is it because you've got a degree and you've worked? Or because God blessed you with it? Be careful how you answer that. You see, the more we realize and the more we, the more we think that we do for ourselves and the more we work for ourselves, the more we're not resting and we're not entering into His rest because we're not ceasing from our own labors. The more we're going to enter into God's rest, if, we, if we're going to enter into God's rest, if we're going to move forward from God, then there's got to be a separation. There's got to be some things that's cut off that say, you know what, I'm not going to worry about that. I'm not worried about a job. I'm going to do just what God's called me to do. I'm going to do what He's asked me to do, and I'm going to follow Him exactly, and I'm going to leave the rest of it with Him, and I'm just going to rest. Because God's got it. Some of the greatest times of rest in my life have come right behind some of the most extreme decisions that I have ever made. You never need to, sometimes, you, what, what's going to happen? If we're going to rest and we're going to find this place of rest, there's got to be some separation. There's got to be some things we've got to separate ourselves from. We've got to cease from our own labors. So often we get to the place that we're trying to work. We're trying to do things ourselves. We're trying to... <laughs> Let me just put it this way. I, I think it maybe helped. When I graduated or, or when I started going to college, that was pretty well one thing. I, I didn't even care whether I went to college or not. But I went because there really wasn't a whole lot else I could do in life and without a degree. So I went and got a degree one of the only things I wanted in life at that time was to have a wife and a family. I began to pray early, early on in my life for God to provide that for me. Not for me to just run out and find somebody. And, and, and let me just tell you this while I'm here. You young folks, don't just run out and marry the first person you find. You pray. And you make sure that God's in who you're marrying. I'm afraid a lot of them just run out and, and marry the first person that'll marry them and, and end up doing something that they regret because they never sought the Lord in it. And I began to ask the Lord to help me. After about three or four years, I began to get really discouraged because the Lord wasn't answering the prayer the way I wanted him to. Now let me tell you, meantime, what I was doing. Meantime, I was doing everything I can't, could to find somebody for myself 
And I had some, and, and I knew what they meant, but I had some people that were behind me that were telling me things like, if you don't go so-and-so, if you don't go do this or you don't know do that, you're never going to find anybody. You're never going to find, you're not even trying. You're never going to find anybody. So I tried, and I went, and I tried, did everything I could to try to find myself a while. And you know what I ended up with? Nothing. Finally, one day, and the Lord used this to break me. Finally, one day, the Lord helped me get to the place. And I told him, it doesn't matter if I spend the rest of my life right by myself. I'm going to do what you ask me to do. And if you want me to have somebody, then you can send her to me. I, I can't do this anymore, and I can't live this way anymore. So I'm through with it. And I'm going to leave it with you. You know what I did? Finally, I ceased from my own labors. Shortly, shortly thereafter is when I met Crystal. And the Lord put that together. I can't tell you how many mistakes I've made in not doing that. And I'm not trying to brag uh, by any means. I'm trying to help us understand with a simple example that when we seek from our own labors, when we quit trying to do things ourselves and let God have it, let God take care of it, let God worry with it, we can enter into a place of rest. When we cease from our own labors, as he did from his, turn with me now back to the book of Joshua. Mention a couple other things real quick. If you read the next few verses, the statement made in verse 8, I want you to notice this. And he says, And it came to pass when they had done circumcising all the people, that they abode in their places in the camp till they were whole. In other words, there was a time when this took place, there was a time that the children of Israel, all of those men that were circumcised, they were, there was a time there of suffering and pain. There was a time there that it hurt. And there's a time when we are separating ourselves from the flesh, when we are cutting and putting away the old man, when we're getting rid of all of those things. It's not easy. It's not, it, it's not something that, that just it, it, it comes easy for us. We're literally having to bury the old man and mortify the flesh and put aside our own wants and our own desires for what the Lord would have us to do and simply put that away for Him and that's not easy to do. And sometimes it takes us a time that we, we just put that aside and the Lord gives us a time to heal. And a time that we could be made whole before we move on and, and before He begins then to ask us to, to, to move forward. There was a time, uh, I remember it, I, I call it, I, I guess, the time that I was converted. And a lot of this didn't have any, any intention of preaching tonight. But the Lord's put it on my heart. The only way I know how to get it across is that my own experiences. But there was a time in my life that I knew the Lord was calling me to preach as well. And I was fighting Him and I was running from it as hard as I could because I did not want to. And I went to a revival service. And at, during that revival service, the Lord got a hold of me and I knew I, there was nothing I could do. And I'd had about enough of that as well. I'd had all of that that I could stand. And I went in the back of that church out by myself. And I got down on my knees and I told the Lord, whatever it is that you want me to do, I'll do it. But I can't keep living this way. I can't keep going the way that I'm going. And whatever it is that you want me to do, I'll do that. I surrender it to you. He gave me peace. He gave me rest. And he gave me about three years to get myself together. Three to five, I don't even remember how many it was, three to five years, something of that nature. Gave me about three, five years to get my life in, in a place that, 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 that I was prepared to go preach, to study, to do my best to try to learn the Word. It gave me a place where I could sit for a moment and heal. And then it got me up, now it's time to go. Now it's time to go move forward. Now it's time to go in and conquer the land. Sometimes the Lord gives us some time to, to stop. To shut down. 
and to, and to separate ourselves from everything. It's not easy to present ourselves as a living sacrifice. It's not easy to take our hopes and dreams and say, Lord, I, t I put all that on the altar for you and I'm through with it. But I'm going to do what you asked me to do. It's not easy. When we do it, the Lord will bless us. And we can go into a life that he would have for us. I want you to notice this. Verse 9 makes the statement, The Lord said unto Joshua, This day have I rolled away the reproach of Egypt from off of you. Wherefore the name of the place is called Gilgal unto this day. Gilgal. The word Gilgal means a rolling away. A rolling away. A wheel, it refers to a wheel. A rolling away. And notice what he says here with this. He says, this day. How, how long have the children of Israel been out of Egypt at this point in time? I don't know exactly, but it's over 40 years. Over 40 years. And the Lord tells them, this day have I rolled the reproach. Notice that this day have I rolled away the reproach of Egypt from off of you. This day. It's that very day that they went into the land of Canaan. This is the time. The, ch the children of Israel walked out of Egypt free. Forty plus years ago. Free from all of that. They were free. You see, oftentimes, that, 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 let, let me define the, the difference to you. We are freed when He saves us. The moment we trust the Lord Jesus Christ, we are freed. He unlocks that jail cell door, swings the door open, and we're free to go whenever we're ready. We can walk out of that prison, but oftentimes we've made our jail cells so comfortable with sin that we don't want to leave where we're at. And that's where the children of Israel were. You remember the statements that they were made, that, that, that they would make God provided them with manna, which in my, from what I can see scripturally speaking would have been the perfect food. As they would eat the manna, they, they, they didn't become vitamin deficient. They didn't have issues. They were eating a piece of bread that God had provided. And He was giving them everything with this manna. And they, they, they would make the statement about this perfect food that God provided for them. We, we loathed it. We, we wanted to go. Oh, we were back in Egypt. And we had the leeks and the onions and melons and, and all that we could eat back in Egypt. Sometimes we get to the place that we're so afraid to move forward because we're comfortable where we're at. We don't want to leave our comfort zone. We don't want to leave the places that we're comfortable that we can't move forward for the Lord. And even when we get out and the Lord pushes us out, so to speak, and has to get us out, that we're still under the reproach of that comfort. We're under the reproach of that place that we've found comfort. Forty years they've been wandering in the wilderness and they're still holding themselves under the reproach of Egypt. Finally, they are freed from it because God set them free. It's only when we get to the place that we can separate ourselves from the flesh and that we can truly separate ourselves from sin that we can realize the freedom that Jesus has given us. Do we really realize sometimes what sin does to us? That sin leads us in a place of destruction. Do you know, every time that I sin, my family in some way has to answer for that. If it's just as simply as because I've sinned, and God's on my case, and I'm in a bad mood, and now they've got to put up with me. But in every way, my family's got to answer for that to, to some degree. They've got to put up. Every way sin leads us into destruction. Well, if I could be freed from sin, then I don't have to worry about any of that anymore. I'm free from the consequences. I'm free from the destruction. 
I'm free from the flesh. And every time we sow to the flesh, that he that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. Right? But if I'm free from the flesh, I don't have to worry about reaping the corruption. But there's a lot of God's people that are saved that they're still wandering around in the wilderness. They're still sowing to the flesh and reaping corruption. And they haven't realized the freedom that they have in Jesus Christ. Today He's given His life to free us. He's given His life to liberate us. He made the statement in John chapter 8 verse 31 that if you continue in my word... He turned to those that were believing, the believing Jews. He said, if you continue in my word, then shall you know the truth. Excuse me. Let me back up a minute. He said, if you, should, if you continue in my word, then shall you be my disciple, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. But there's a lot of people that trusted the Lord Jesus Christ that they're saved. And they're still living in a place that they're not liberated. They're still in bondage to the flesh. They're still reaping corruption. And they have not realized the land of Canaan that God set out before them. And this morning, or this evening rather, what I want to encourage you to do is separate. Separate from that old man that you could realize what God's got set out before you. What God's got in front of you. Start sowing to the Spirit and start reaping some life everlasting and abundant life that he's provided for us that we can have i want to i want to give you one more scripture turn with me to second timothy second timothy the first four verses in second timothy the whole subject is the idea of truth. Timothy is in a position as a young man where he is the only pastor in Asia. He's the pastor of the church at Ephesus at this time. He's the only pastor in Asia who is still continuing to preach the truth exactly as Paul had preached it. Many of the other men in, in Asia had forsaken and were ashamed of Paul. They were ashamed of Paul because his bonds... And so what Paul is doing is he's encouraging Timothy to continue to stand for the truth. So what he does is he says this in verse 1, Thou therefore, he says, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. In other words, let me just continue. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others. What he's telling Timothy to do is that I've given you the truth. You're the only one that's standing for the truth in Asia. This is my own words. And what you're about to do and what you're about to embark on is not going to be easy. You're going to have to, you're going to, have to stand for the truth amongst your own people who are going to, they're going to call you down. They're going to tell you all kinds of things. And so he says, take these things that I've given you. Take these things that I've taught you and commit them to faithful men. I want to tell us something as, as Sunday school teachers. Teachers in general of the Lord's Word, we have a responsibility that hangs over us that is so amazing and so great a responsibility that we have. What if I walked in here tonight and I would have told y'all, you know what? I heard a man make a statement one day. He, 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 he was asked to fill in for a Sunday school teacher. He took the book and he opened it. And he said, to tell you the truth, I haven't even read the lesson. And so here's what we're going to do. We're going to read through the lesson in Sunday school today. What if I did that this evening? I came and I said, to tell you the truth, I, I didn't even stop to study to preach the message tonight. I just figured we'd come in here and we'd read the Bible together. If the church has asked you, with the leadership of God, to be a teacher, a Sunday school teacher, whatever the position, 
The Scripture says importantly here, commit to faithful men. Let me tell you the church something right here. Don't, call, don't elect somebody to be a Sunday school teacher because you want to encourage them. Because what you're going to do is you're going to find a Sunday school class that needs a teacher. That's what, every time you turn around, you're going to need somebody teaching that class. Because either they're never there or they're unprepared and it's not being done. But you take the truth and you commit it to faithful men that are willing to teach. If you are a Sunday school teacher, be prepared to teach the truth. Be prepared, be studied, be ready to, ready to teach the lesson that, is, that has been given at the church. And, and even the lessons that, that have been written, they've been prepared for a reason. And I'm not trying to get down on all Sunday school teachers and, and that kind of thing. I just want us to understand the responsibility that we have. It's extreme, it's important. And we need to be prepared. And we need to teach the Word of God. And so... Notice as he's continued, this continues in the context. He says, verse 3, he says, Thou therefore endure hardness. In other words, you endure all of this that's coming. You put aside how you feel. You put aside what you want to do. You put aside wanting to give up and quit. You put aside how it makes you feel. You put aside all of this, this fleshly being. You separate yourself from that. Why? He said, because a good soul, as a good soldier of Jesus Christ, no man that warreth, no man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life. If we're going to war a good warfare for Jesus Christ in the position that he's called us to be in, we're going to have to separate ourselves from the old man. We're going to have to put aside what we want. We're going to have to put aside glory for ourselves. If you're teaching to glorify yourself, or if you're trying to teach or stand up to do something that the church could brag on you or that you could shine a light on you, you're still in the glory of Jesus Christ. So he's telling Timothy, you put all that behind you. You put all of that old man back behind you. And you look forward to what God's asked you to do. You don't entangle yourself with all of that old man. Because if you do, you're not going to be able to fight what's in front of you. And you've got a war to face that's going to need your full attention. Today we've got a war that we face that needs our full attention. We've got a war that we face as a church that needs our full a a attention. We need to have our minds on what we're doing. And what God's called us to do. To finish kind of where I ended this morning, every one of us, God's called us to a place. God's called us to something. He's got something that He wants us to do. We need to find what that is. We need to look for what that is and we need to get busy about doing it. We need to separate ourselves from the old man. We need to cut away the old man that we could see what it would be to, that God would have us to do going forward. Some of the reasons that we can't, I mentioned that this morning, some of the reasons that we can't see what God would have us to do is because we hadn't separated ourselves from the old man long enough to be able to see what he'd have us to do. Today the children of Israel moved over into the land of Canaan and the first thing that God told them to do, get rid of the flesh. Get rid of the flesh. If we're going to go over and possess what God's given us, if we're going to go and possess the inheritance that God's given us, that he's left us here, the first thing we're going to do is have to, we're going to have to get rid of the flesh so that we can see clearly to move forward in what he'd have us to do while we have a verse of a song.